Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back. Got a very, very, very special guest. Mr. Bill Dance. Bill, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, it's great to be here, Joe. Great to be here with you, buddy. So you might not remember this, but I, I want to kind of tell you a special story for me. And it was the first time that I met you. And it was iCast of 2015. My brother and I had recently sold our company. We started Salt Strong. And uh, we'd kind of really hit it off with with. Tom Rowland, number one, who I know is a good friend of yours. And then. Oh, yeah. Tom, Tom's a great guy. Such a good. He was so helpful. And then the other guy was old Captain Jeff Maggio, old Lunker Dog. <laughs> old Lunker Dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did several shows together down Fort Lauderdale area. That guy's a character. And so, you know, he, we were we were walking the floor with him at ICAST. It's our very first ICAST. We're complete newbies. We're like nobodies at this time in the industry. And he's like, hey, do you want to meet Bill Dance? And, and we see you over there. And, man, you've got like a line of people that want to get photos with you and talk to you. And, and Luke and I were kind of giddy. We're like, oh, heck, yeah. Like, we grew up watching him. Like, that'd be awesome. And and you never know when you're going to meet someone that you've seen on TV exactly, you know, how they're going to be. If you're going to be let down or if it's going to be, you know, completely different. And I just got to tell everyone listening here, not only was he like just the most normal guy and like took time to actually talk to us and asked about Salt Strong and what we were doing and what the goals were. And I'll never forget this, Bill, at the very end. And once again, there's a line of people like I'm I can see the people behind you angry that I'm taking so long talking to you. And I only said my name one time when Jeff, Captain Jeff introduced us. And at the very end, you shook my hand. You said, Joe, it was so good to meet you and talk to you. And like, you remember my name and everything. I was like, wow. And I was just blown away. I walked away with just like. Man, this guy is the the real deal, and probably a, a big part of the reason that you know so many amazing things have, have happened to you in your career. And uh, and just who who can't like Bill Dance? I mean, when someone you know does that and just creates a a pretty awesome experience for me in the first time meeting you. So, uh, so thank you, man. Well, well I, I appreciate that. It's usually hard for me to remember things. The hardest three years of my life was the first grade, and uh, I failed it. So anyway. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, was that? I believe that was in. Was that in Orlando? That was Orlando. Or yep. was in Vegas. Yeah, it was. Or- yeah, it was. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we were in Vegas there for several years, and then we the last few years we've been in in Orlando with the ICAST show. Yeah, I think that was the first year that they had brought it uh brought it back. But um, I, I want to cover some things that a lot of people don't know about you, and and you know I've I've spent a lot of time with with Peter Deeks, and I know you've been you know, using him quite a bit on your, your saltwater shows. And uh, I was asking him, I was like, man, what are, what are some things that a lot of people don't know about Bill? And one in particular that it's pretty similar to, to Peter is how he, he believes a big reason he got so dialed in with the fish is he wanted to be a doctor and really started studying the anatomy and the biology of these fish and the lateral lines. And, and, and apparently you were the same. You wanted to be a doctor and your grandfather was a doctor. Is that right? Well, my daddy, my granddaddy, my great granddaddy, my great great for five generations back were all doctors and uh the uh I learned more from my granddaddy, I guess, than, than my daddy. My daddy was more into hunting than fishing, but although he was a big fisherman and you know, I guess I was blessed growing up that uh I, my daddy and granddaddy gave me the greatest gift of all and that was introducing me to the great outdoors and uh I I really enjoyed fishing more than I did hunting. I used to do a lot of hunting, duck hunting, uh, living here off the Mississippi River. Uh, and then I spent a lot of my younger days, my youth, over in Middle Tennessee, where I did a lot of rabbit hunting and squirrel hunting. And uh, But I just, there was something about fishing that I just, I just loved to do. And I spent more time fishing. And I, like I say, I was blessed to have a daddy and granddaddy that, uh, spent a lot of time with me as a youngster and it took me fishing so but more time with my granddaddy and the one thing my granddaddy taught me was not as much technique but he taught me more about uh, how fish hear and how fish see and I never forgot those things and I remember uh, when it first hit home 
uh, back in those early days growing up, you didn't have fast pro shops or academies or Walmarts or the big department chains. The only place that you could buy fishing lures was hardware stores. Hmm. And uh, I remember in Lynchburg, where I really spent most of my time, uh, fishing Mulberry Creek, uh, wading the creek. That's what, and today, still my favorite form of fishing, moving water. Uh, I would walk in that store, and it was owned by Hunter Motlow. And the Motlows were the proprietors of Jack Daniels Distillery. After Jack Daniels passed away, Lim Motlow became the proprietor, and then his sons uh, took over after that. But one of the sons, Connor, on the hardware store and the bank there in Lynchburg. And I would go in that store almost every day there on the square. And he had mostly arbor gas lures. And I would look in that case and I said, uh, Clayton Tosh, the old guy that ran the hardware store for Connor. I said, let me see that lure again, Tosh. And he'd pull it out. He had Hawaiian wigglers. He had Butter bugs, hula dancers, and these were old time baits. But he had one particular bait, and that bait is still made today. And uh, he'd hand it, and you look, I'd look at it, and I said, Can I take it out of the box? And he said, Yeah, you've done it a dozen times. And I'd take it out of the box, and it was a Arbogast jitterbug, frog color. Mm. And that was the prettiest bait. I, I just, I could just see it now over and over and over again. And, uh, I'd go home and I'd tell my grandmother about it. And she says, well, how much is that bait? And I said, 75 cents. And she said, well, why don't you just go down there and buy that bait? And I said, well, I'll pay you back. And my grandmother kept her money in a handkerchief or change. And she reached in her apron and pulled out her handkerchief. And she gave me three quarters. Didn't think about taxes back in those days. I, I ran to the square as fast as I could. We just lived, lived right off the square, right down on Mulberry Creek. I ran to the square as fast as I could go. I said, Tosh, let me see that bait, that lure. And he gave it to me, and I threw three quarters up there on the counter. And a couple of days later, small town of Lynchburg, you'd close. The square would close at noon, one day a week. All the businesses would close. And uh, granddaddy, we'd go either to the creek, once, every once in a while we'd go to a lake. And my granddaddy loved to fish for red ears, the shell crackers. And he'd bottom fish. He had several casting rods. And I had just recently, he had just recently uh, bought me a, a metal rod made by True Temper. And I had a Shakespeare reel, 1940 model Shakespeare reel with braided line and, a, and I put a section of cat gut we call it monofilament today on it and I put that jitterbug on it and I, they grandmother spread a blanket and she sit there under a shade tree and crochet we went to a lake called Cumberland Springs a spring fed lake and granddaddy sat on the shade tree and I walked down on a point down through some buck brush as I walked out on this point, I looked to my right, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw two bass swimming along, one about two and a half pounds and one about a pound. And I took this jitterbug, and I made four or five false casts. And I was so excited. My heart was just pounding. <laughs> and I made I made a pretty accurate cast. And I missed the target by about 20 feet, which was perfect, because that cast began... It that started changing my direction in life, and I'll huh. tell you how it happened. I started four or five casts, and when the bait hit the water, these two bass swimming along stopped. They just it instantly stopped, and I first the first thought was, those fish heard that bait hit the water. And I said, Granddaddy talked about how fish hear sounds, and he talked about me wading the creek, and I was walking along the gravel bottoms, and I, I needed to walk slow, and I always needed to wade up creek where I didn't stir the bottom and fish could see the mud coming down and uh, walk away from the bank and watch my shadows and stuff. Fish could see and they could see the shadows and they could hear. And uh, 
try to walk in the sand or walk in the mud versus walking on the gravel and how the how fish can hear sound mm. uh, with their inner ear and with their lateral line and uh, how they hear near field sounds. And uh, those fish stopped when that bait hit the water. And I said, they can't see it. It's, it's, it's a good 20 feet away, but they heard the bait hit the water. So I started moving the bait. And once I started moving it, both fish turned in the direction of the bait and started swimming in the direction of the bait. And I said, they can hear that bait. And I stopped the bait. They stopped. I started the bait moving again. That old, 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 the old jitterbug made that yeah. wobbling sound. And they started moving. I'd stop it and they'd stop. I'd start it and they'd start. I'd stop, they'd stop. I'd start, they'd start. And I, I just kept saying, good night, good night. They, they hear it, they hear it. And, uh, Eventually, the bigger fish, he always told me the bigger fish is the most dominant fish in a school. And uh, eventually, the fish, the bigger fish got within two feet of the bait, and I stopped it. And I said, he can see the bait now. They can see it. And I started the movement of the bait again, and the bigger fish witnessing this was the most thrilling thing I'd ever seen. And I said, here I've got a pony, a piece of plastic with an aluminum lip and two treble hooks. And I, I mean, this, this was, I'd always fish with crawfish and helgramites in the creek live bait, you know. Yep. yep. And here I was throwing an artificial plug and witnessing this. I could see it just like looking in a glass of, of, of ice water. And then all of a sudden I started the bait again, and this bigger fish just charged into the bait and hit it. And then the other fish were trying to get it and take it away from me. <laughs> and to experience and to experience this, this was here I'm seven years old, and to experience this, it was it was the biggest thrill of my life. And I started reeling it. And I reeled the fish and watching the fish fight underwater and the other fish trying to hit the bait too. It was it was I, I just couldn't it was just more than I could stand. And I reeled him about six or eight feet and I couldn't take it anymore. I was scared to death he'd get off. I threw the rod over my shoulder and well roped the line. <laughs> And I well roped. I pull, I literally pulled the fish up on the bank, and I, I did. And then I That's I great. ran him up on the bank. And then I reeled up my line as fast as I could, and I took off running through the bushes and ran back to where my granddaddy was. And I was just screaming and shaking. You could have cracked a wall in between my kneecaps. I was shaking so hard. And I said, "Look, look, look, look what I did! Look what I did! Look what I did!" And uh, he said, "Let's put it on the stringer. We'll take it home. We need to get a picture of it." Well, back then we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have uh, point and snap cameras, but we we took a picture of it, and I still I've got that picture today. First book, uh, big book we ever wrote, Bass and Objects. We put that picture in there, and I've still got that picture today of the first bass I caught at seven years old. But That's too cool. The thing the thing that was so impressive of learning the importance of sight and sound and witnessing all of that, and all the things that my granddaddy talked about sound and walking the bank and wading the creek and uh, shadows and, and movement, uh, all of those things started coming into play. And all of that later in life helped me. And I, uh, that one strike in witnessing all of that, uh, it changed my whole direction in life. And it, it just made me love the artificial lure game. And it, it made me, it put me where I am today. It just, uh, I, I think about that. I think about that strike so, so often. And, uh, mm. and you know, uh, I've got a, a buddy of mine took a big piece of driftwood and cut a big notch in that driftwood and took a jitterbug and, and planted it into that notch, into that piece of driftwood and shellacked it. And, and then and wrote inside that driftwood with a plaque that said where it all started and gave it to me. And I've got it hanging on my oh, office wow. wall today. But it's uh, that's where it all started, uh, the artificial lure game. And that's why I love to fish artificial lures. And, you know, people say you started saltwater and uh, inshore fishing, and that's so much like freshwater. It's got so much familiarities, uh, you know. It, but uh, yep, it's... Uh, it's it's just uh, that's really where it all started. That's and, too uh, cool. Were, were your um, was your dad and, and, and grandfather were they were they disappointed that you didn't go down the doctor route? I have to imagine. No, they, you know, they, they no, not a bit. Huh. They never 
they never uh, tried to encourage me. My, my mother never encouraged me to go that route. My grandsons at the University of Tennessee studying to be a doctor. I've got twin twin grandsons at the University of Tennessee. One studying to be a, a doctor, and the other one studying to be an attorney. So, so uh, uh, at least I've got one one in the family going on carrying on the medical career. So that's pretty cool. Because back uh, then there wasn't. You know, there there wasn't a like. I mean, there wasn't TV shows when you were you know you were twenty years old. There wasn't you know. I I guess there were some anglers who were sponsored, maybe, or, or did you kind of help? You kind there of was help? one. There was one. Get about Gaddis. Uh, Vern Gaddis had a show sponsored by Liberty Mutual, okay. and I, I eventually met Gaddis uh, Vern, and I did some seminars with him. And he was a dandy old gentleman. He lived in Palatka, Florida, and we did promotions together, and. uh several promotions together and he was a he was just a, a wonderful old gentleman but he had a he was the first one i ever met that had a fishing show and sponsored by uh let me think what was the name of his show uh hmm. i told you first hardest three years of my life was the first grade <laughs> um, but the flying fisherman the flying fisherman. Ah. He flew in wherever he, he went. It was a flying fisherman with Gadabad Gaddis. And uh but he he's the first one and then after that I know uh championship fishing came along with Virgil Ward and uh and Virgil was a great guy. I was fortunate to have known Virgil and be a guest on his show several times and and then one of my real good buddies, he just passed away the uh, day before yesterday, uh, Monday morning, was Jerry McInnes. Mm. And uh, I wouldn't be doing TV today had it not been for Jerry. Uh, Jerry had a very popular show called The Fishing Hole. And then Jerry went on to produce shows for ESPN, uh, J&M Productions, and uh, uh, he bought BASS. But... Uh, we lost Jerry the day before yesterday. Mm. Uh, but Jerry was a great, great guy. And he had a very, very good show, very popular show uh, on ESPN, the Bass Masters. And uh, I don't know, there's a lot of guys that had, had good fishing shows. Uh, and Fisherman, Al Linder. Al's a great guy that oh, yeah. produced a wonderful show and still does. Uh, with a bunch of us, uh, Hank Parker and uh, Roland and I just finished doing a tribute to. Uh, Hank last week. Uh, well, I shouldn't say. That. I hope. I hope he didn't hear this because it's a surprise. But uh, uh, this is a couple. It'll it be a couple weeks out before we publish this. So. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we. Uh, but a lot of guys have got good programs today. Uh, Hank's still doing his show. He's got a good show. Roland Jimmy's doing a good show, and um, then uh, there's a lot of good uh, saltwater shows out there. We started about eight years ago. We just felt like we had gone as far as we could go with freshwater. And we still, we do 39 shows a year, original shows a year, 13 freshwater, or 26 freshwater and 13 saltwater. And, uh, of course we do quite a bit with Peter because Peter is such a knowledgeable and great guest. And, uh, he's probably the best. He's probably one of the best fishermen that we've we've ever fished with. Extremely knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just he's just fantastic and uh, knows what he's doing and uh, comes across well. And we love we love fishing with Peter. And uh, probably he's probably as good without question. He's probably the best I've ever fished with. Uh, uh, as far as inshore fishing, he's. Uh, Extremely good on trout, redfish, harpin, uh, snook, and uh, and then of course we do stuff uh, across the Gulf Coast, as far away as Texas, you know, Louisiana, and then down the eastern or down the western coast of Florida to Key West, and then up the eastern coast of Florida all the way up to Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and excuse me, in the shows that we do. Salt water and then fresh water, we just scatter it all over the place. But uh, we've been doing it. We're 
we're in our 54th year. Son of a gun. Dang. That's, we've been doing it a long time. <laughs> well, well I, I heard, I think it was on the Tom Rowland podcast. I'd listened to that one with you and you had mentioned, you know, back in the day, especially for some of the, the younger folks that, you know, didn't grow up with a TV guide and, 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 and regional, you know, like it wasn't like just everything was national like it is today or getting on Hulu or all these places. And you were doing all these really small local shows. And at one point, it was like 200. Is that right? Like 200 shows a year. And you were editing all this, the, the things yourself. Like, this is crazy. <clears throat> Well, what what happened, Joe? We started doing a local show. I was working for Cordell Lure Company, Cotton Cordell, and uh, made the hot spot and a lot of red fan, a lot of those lures back in the day. Cotton came to me. I was helping Jerry McKinnis at the time, doing a lot of stuff and uh, working. Uh, Charles Spence and I owned Strike King Lure Company back in those early days. And, uh, uh, I don't know. I went on my way and Charles went on his way and Charles continued with Strike King Lure Company and Cotton offered me a fantastic job. And one day Cotton said, Bill, we need a TV show. And I said, okay. Uh, uh, I've got the perfect guy for it. And he said, who's that? And I said, Jerry McKinnis. And he said, no. He said, Jerry's good. But I've got somebody else in mind. And I said, who's that? And he said, you. And I I said, what? And he said, you. I said, Cotton, me doing a TV show like pouring perfume on a pig. I said, I can't even, I, I can't even spell television. He said, well, you better start learning. He said, I said, well, I've learned a lot helping Jerry and working with Jerry. But I said, man, I, I can't. He said, I, I he said, what kind of camera does Jerry have? And I said, well, he's shooting a Canon Scoopy. And he said, well, we'll get you a Canon Scoopy. And he just started learning. Well, I got with a couple of TV guys here in Memphis. And I talked to Jerry about it. And Jerry was very helpful. And uh, he, even offered, he offered to help me any way he could. And he thought it was a good idea, bless his heart. And uh, we started a local show. On the ABC, I was turned down by NBC and CBS affiliates here in Memphis. They said there's no market for it. But fortunately, the ABC affiliate here, uh, program director, we had something in common. And he used to do a local show at WBBJ in Jackson, Tennessee. And he said, let's, let's go for it. And, uh, we did. And we started. It went well. And uh, all of a sudden, their sister station in Jackson, Mississippi, said, would you be interested in doing one for us? And I said, well, yeah. And I was good because it was the state capital. Uh, the governor liked to fish. The uh, uh, director gave him fish, was a big fisherman. Uh, Boating safety. I had everything to pull guests from, and local fishermen there at Big Ross Barnett, Jackson, Mississippi. So I started doing a local one there. Well, there's, believe it or not, their sister station, WBRZ, Channel 2 in Baton Rouge, said, Hey, how about doing one for us? <laughs> I said, Okay. And so I said, All right, let's, let's do it. And then I got a call from J.C. Penny in Paducah, Kentucky. And the manager of that store said, hey, I've seen several of your shows. Would you mind doing a TV show for us? And I said, well, I guess so. So I was doing four markets 52 weeks a year. Ooh, all, and all different content. I, I'm sure you can maybe mix and match a little bit, but it was. Yeah, well, I, I, I'd go up, I'd go up to Paducah and I'd shoot shows on Kentucky Lake and I would shoot shows here and shoot shows there around Kentucky Lake, up at Real Foot Lake and various locations. And, uh, and then, uh, then I would shoot, uh, I, I would shoot, uh, uh, and I'd, I'd shoot at, at, at these 
different locations. And uh, I would take footage from the Memphis area, from the Jackson, Mississippi area, and from Louisiana, and I would intermix it, you know, and then I'd take shows from Paducah and show them in Baton Rouge, and shows from Jackson and show them from Baton Rouge, Paducah, Memphis. You know, I'd intermix the the, the video from, uh, uh, you know, the film from different locations. <laughs> Excuse me. Then when I'd go to Paducah, I'd have local guests and stuff. You know, and I had it going. So in other words, what I would do, I ended up doing four markets, four markets, uh, 208 shows a year. Four markets, 52 weeks, four times 52 is 208 shows a year. Son of a God. And I did that for several years. And then my buddy in uh, Baton Rouge, I gave him my show. And then I had another buddy in Jackson. I said, hey, Ernest, you want this show? He said, I'd love to have it. So I gave him that show. And then I quit the show in Baton R- in Paducah. And I continued with Memphis for a little while. Then we syndicated Bill. We had it. It was Outdoors with Bill Dance. And the TV guy kept putting Outdoors in that time slot. And I said, I'm going to stop this. So I changed it around from Outdoors with Bill Dance to Bill Dance Outdoors. Uh-huh. And then the TV guy started putting Bill Dance at that time slot. <clears throat> so it was Bill Dance Outdoors and said Outdoors with Bill Dance. So we um, we ran it um, through syndication, through 90 network markets for a period of time. And then... There was a cable, uh, ESPN popped up, and we left syndication because syndication was skyrocketing in cost, and we moved Bill Dance Outdoors to ESPN. This was a long time ago. And for about three years, we blanketed the country on ESPN. But the demographics just really they just wasn't there. And it was a good network. We were in New York, uh, Toronto, Spokane, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, Phoenix, Dallas, uh, New Orleans, Miami, Raleigh, uh, and then all throughout the Midwest, to the Southwest, to the Southeast, and every major market across the country. And but demographically, we just didn't hit that loyal brand buying market that we really wanted. And all of a sudden, excuse me, all of a sudden, a little network over in, excuse me again, a, a little network over in Nashville, Tennessee called TNN, the oh, Nashville yeah. Network popped up. And we looked at it, and they had NASCAR, they had bull riding, they had country western, <laughs> and we talked, started talking to their program director, David Hall, and we we moved over there. We picked up Walmart. We picked up Chevrolet. We picked up Marina. We picked up some major, major sponsors, and we were off and running. We had a perfect, perfect niche. And well, you found you found your people just, right I, at uh, TNN. That's where I, your people I, were. Oh yeah, we we hit demographics. We I mean we we just we went off the chart. And for fifteen years, we just we were just we were just rocking and rolling. And all of a sudden, Gaylord Enterprises, Opryland, the they just changed directions. The TNN sold out to a network in New York and uh, the network we we just the ratings just went the other way and we moved to a network called the Outdoor Life Network and then they moved they changed that network to Spike and finally we moved to, we changed, we moved to NBC Sports, 
uh, Discovery, the Outdoor Channel, and the Sportsman Channel. And at that time, we were running four networks, Sportsman Channel, Outdoor Channel, NBC Sports, and Discovery. And we rocked along with that for several years, and we found out our best numbers were on the Outdoor Channel, the Sportsman Channel. So we we dropped Discovery, and we dropped NBC Sports. And where we are today is on the Outdoor Channel with Freshwater and on the Sportsman Channel with Saltwater. And we're doing very well with those two networks. So that's where that's where we are today, 52 weeks a year, and we're airing 535 times a year oh. on both those networks. So that's where Bill Dance Outdoors and Bill Dance Saltwater, uh, that's where we run today. And our social media is doing phenomenally well, too. So with Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook. And our, our YouTube is doing real well, too. Every, everything. I mean, you're... Thank, it, thank the good Lord. Yeah, and this is... Uh, this would be an interesting answer here because right now everyone knows you. I, I think the term is Bill Dance is America's favorite fisherman. I've seen that before. I have to imagine back then, this is all new. I mean, you were basically disrupting the bass fishing world. Did did a lot of people hate you like uh, what we call them, the good old boy network that, you know, that, that were probably great fishermen but didn't have their shows? Like were you, was it a tough time? Like were you hated by a lot of people in the early days of, of doing all this? I never got anybody, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody ever, nobody ever, ever said they hated me. Uh, you never got uh, in bar fights or anything like that, cousin. No, I, I, I never got, I never got hit with any, anything like that. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody probably did, but they never said it. Uh, but uh, they never said it. There may have been somebody that hated me, but it, we 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 were very very fortunate that we got good comments, and uh, it, it it all seemed like it went good. Thank the good Lord. You pro- it was probably helpful not to have social media where everyone has a uh, a voice, and you got all these negative Nancys. I, I was- oh, we oh we got we got stuff. Uh, oh, we got stuff that. Uh, Comments. Oh, we, yeah, we got a little comment here and there that somebody said, well, you know, this and uh, you, you'd get some little negative stuff every once in a while. And we would come back. Our producer would come back and, 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 and send something back in a positive in a positive uh, with, with a positive comment of saying, uh, you know, sorry you feel that way. Uh, uh, Oh, somebody would say, well, I can catch fish bigger than him, or I can do that. That's, that's fine. Okay, that's good. Uh, you know, but we always, we just always come back with a positive comment about that. So, you know, you, you always get that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious. And what, but, but, one, we, we, but overall, it's always been good. I love it. Um, one other uh, thing Peter Deke said was, I said, man, what's one other thing that I might not know about Bill? And he says, let me tell you. He says, Bill Dance. Oh, no. oh, oh, oh. He says, he is the best catfish angler maybe of all time in, in, in America. And he's like, this guy, he, he, he's like, a lot of people don't know that. Because I've seen your Mississippi River Monster Tournament. I get, I see all the face or Instagram stuff. But he's like, Bill, like, still enters catfish tournaments. And is beating everybody. He's like, he is he is one of the best catfish anglers of all time. Oh, <laughs> is that hey, true? And- and, and let me tell you something. And Peter's crazy. It, I tell you what, he's crazy as a sprayed roach. Let me tell you. <laughs> he, he 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 had to put that in there. No, I am not. I've I've been lucky. We just finished a good catfish shoot last week, about fifty miles south of Memphis, uh, where we uh, where we we caught some real good ones. My buddy caught a ninety-two pounder, but uh, we. Uh, and then we went to a Cabela's tournament uh, down on Wheeler Lake. And we got our, I got our, our fanny spanked. Uh, we got beat real bad. So if I was that good, I'd have caught some fish. But no, we weren't that good. Uh, we we got we got spanked pretty bad. But you really do uh, enter tournament. Yeah. You're still doing catfish tournaments, though. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh huh. We had a good year last year. We had a couple of seconds. 
Uh, we won one. We had a couple of seconds, a third, a fourth, a fifth. But uh, now Peter, Peter's a sale cat champion. Uh, <laughs> in fact, he got he got pinned last uh, about a month ago. He sent, he sent me sent me a picture of his thumb all bandaged up. He's uh Peter. Peter's a who? He's a, he's a great guy. Yeah, I was but, I was uh, with him two days after that, and it was. I mean, he he got uh he got nailed by that cat. It was nasty. Oh, it really was. Yeah. Those things aren't anything to fool around with. Mm-hmm. And as many as he's handled, I told him, I said, make me a promise. You'll never pull another one in the boat. Just cut the line. <laughs> uh, but he's uh, those things are about it. So one, uh, I'll go go for. It. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. I, I was going to say one other thing that you kind of touched on. I, I'm curious because uh, I wasn't around back then. I was born in the late late seventies. But I mean, did you start Strike King? Like you were one of the founders, and then you walked away from it, or what? what was no, the... our, our good buddy Bill McEwen owned it. And then he sold it. He sold it to Charles, and then Charles and I became partners okay. uh, there for a period of time. So we owned it together there for a short period of time, and then uh, uh, then I turned it over to uh, I turned it over to Charles, and then I went to work for Cotton Cordell. Got it. And then that's when we started uh, Bill Dance Outdoors. Very cool. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You picking up your friends? Yeah, we, we yeah, yeah, we're fine. And uh, so, and where, where are you guys? Where are you guys heading? You going bass fishing? Yeah, we're gonna give it a shot today. Oh yeah. We've got a forty nine degrees and a light south wind, and uh, we're gonna go up here in the country, up in Hardeman County, it's a little about a 60, 70 acre lake, and give it a shot. Very cool. Uh, but uh, what's your weather? What's your weather like in Florida today? Well, I, I'm here in uh, in Winter Haven, Florida. I think you know where where that is. Where old Bagley Bates used to used to be right near right near oh, me. Yeah. Yep. Jim was Jim was a great sponsor for a long time. Yep. Yep. So it's it's um man, we still haven't had that cold front yet. I mean, it's you know it's still eighty degrees right now, a little overcast. Um, not much wind today, but yeah, it's uh, we haven't had that that cold front yet. I'm going camping with the kids this weekend, so I'm hoping we get one. There's nothing worse than camping in ninety degree weather. <laughs> oh, I think I think I don't know if it's going to come that far south. If it's going to turn back more to the northeast, but uh, uh, y'all have great weather down there. Oh yes, a couple of quick ones, and I'll I'll let you go here. What? No, that's great. What What do you think is is one of the the bigger just game changers that you've seen over the years for for fishermen in terms of of help? And it could be anything from uh, from braided oh. line to and, and actually you did. I'll give you a little shout out here. You and thank and a huge thank you. Peter Deeks is doing that fish finder course, and he showed me a little surprise that you joined on and showed. That Garmin, I think it's live scope, and like you could literally see yeah, the sent, bass hitting the crankbait. I was like, "What in the world?" Yeah, we sent that to Peter. It's uh, that is a major game changer. Um, every year, uh, like last year uh, at ICAST, best of show, Garmin won best of show with uh, their new. With their new trolling motors. Uh, year before last, Garmin won best of show with uh, Pan Optics with their Lasco. And so we did a piece for you uh, for your show, uh, for your, you know, for your. And I sent it to Peter. I don't know if he's shown it to you. Yeah, yet or I, not. I just, I literally just saw it uh, yesterday and I was like, holy smokes. Uh, you could see the yeah, bass hitting the crankbait. I, I was crazy. Right. Right. It's, uh, it's where I talk about it on the set. And then I said, uh, better yet, let me just show you. And then I showed you, I, I show a shot. I said, do you believe a bass can hit a crankbait? And the angler not know it. 
So you feel the actual vibration of the bait going tick, 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 and then you absolutely lose the feel. And you might assume that that tick, tick, tick is a leaf, a piece of grass, moss, or whatever. But actually, in reality, sometimes a bass could actually have it in its mouth and then open its mouth and release it. Is it possible? In reality, that could be a bass. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? I said, watch this. And then I show an underwater video shot of a bass actually hitting a crankbait. He hits the bait, and I show it in slow motion. He hits the bait, takes it in his mouth, closes his mouth, and then opens his mouth and spits the bait out. I don't know. Did you see that on video? I have seen it. it uh, once again, I was blown away. I, 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 I didn't that, know you were going to be... Close. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to be part of it. And then I saw that, and I was like, holy smokes. I know. it. That that blows your mind. Then I said, now, let me show it to you on on live scope. And then I, I said, here's the cast. You see me making the cast. You see the bait hit the water. And then you see the bait go underwater. And you go to live scope, and you see the actual bait swimming. Then you see the bait underwater. And then you see the, the fish, the target, come up, you see him hit the bait, release the bait, then the bait go on and the bass turn and chase the bait just for a minute, and then the fish turns off and the bait goes on. And and that is stronger than a hundred acres of fresh cut garlic. So that's what we sent you. Uh. And also yeah, I mean it it's powerful. Yes. So so you see it, an actual video of a bass actually hitting a bait, and then I show it to you on live scope when I send it to you with the grass. So to tell you over the years what innovations have come, uh, the weight of rods, the sensitivity in rods, the hooks, the sharpness in hooks, uh, braided lines, the diameter of braided lines, um, our grass. Uh, now with panoptics, uh, with live scope, every year we just seem to, with trolling motors now, the power of trolling motors, trolling motors now with no bushings that are extremely wide, um, the weight of the trolling motors, the, uh, uh, every year it just seems to be, uh, something new. And what's on the drawing board for 2020, uh, what Garmin comes with every year, they've got they've got some great new stuff they're going to introduce uh, uh, at ICAST for 2020, uh, and of course other companies too. So every year it's uh, there's a new game changer. You there? Can you oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes, sir. I, uh, I've, I've, I I'm enjoying every minute. I don't want to interrupt you, man. So uh, two big, big. Uh, Pluses with Garmin, especially, has been uh, pan optics, and secondly, it's been uh, the new force trolling motor. Uh, of course, both winning back-to-back -back years as best show uh, at ICAST in Orlando. So, uh, so uh, you go. Go for, ahead. Joe. I'll go for it, Bill. I'm sorry. I was going to say yes. for for the young kids out there, and I don't say young kids, but but the, this younger generation, the you know twenties and thirties, and, and you're seeing a lot of them, you know, are, are really great anglers. Uh, they they really do love the sport. What what advice do you have for them in terms of uh, of making it happen and making a name for themselves and and, and and really growing a brand like you did, not just you know getting a pro staff deal, but to to really grow a brand, what what do you see some of the mistakes some of these the next generation is is making, and, and what are some of the maybe pitfalls or, or best advice you have? Well, you know uh, these high school teams are are are, are growing at leaps and bounds, and mm -hmm. the college teams are growing by leaps and bounds. You know, get involved with that and try not to learn too much too fast. It's good, and I heard I heard that you still write. Like handwritten thank you notes, not every day perhaps, but you're still doing that pretty pretty consistently. Just the small little oh, things yeah, like that, right? 
Yeah, we do it about two days a week. Oh, God. Uh, I go in the office. Uh, Leslie or Pamela have a list. And they said, here, take care of this. i tell you someone that I respect that does so much of that is Johnny Morris. Mm. Uh, but uh, that goes a long way with people. Yeah, yes. we do it. I've always. Uh, my mother was big on that. And I guess I got it from her. Well, I, I want to thank you because I, I I heard that you did that, and I bought a thousand thank you cards that just say Salt Strong on it, and I I'll just do it to some random new new members who join our club or buy things like our Fish Finder course coming out very soon, and it's crazy the amount of people that will message me back or even call me. And just want to, they want to thank me for my thank you letter because no one does that anymore. No one's getting handwritten letters in the mail. And I think if anyone's listening, if you want something that's going to separate you from the pack, that small little gesture, even if it's just once or twice a week, writing a couple of them to random people out of the blue that don't expect it, uh, it, it, it really is, uh, is a powerful way just to, just to really show your thanks. It does. I've got a little card that goes, it's a, on it, it's just a it's a line. It goes goes across the car to a fish hook. And it's just a line from Bill Dan on it. And it, if you did, if it didn't say anymore, it's just I can't thank you enough, and you just sign it. You know what I mean? Yep, that's great. It's just it, it acknowledge. You can just acknowledge somebody. I got a call out of the blue the other day. Kevin Van Dam called me, and he just said, "I apologize, I hadn't called you. I'm a, a week late in calling you on your birthday, but I just." Wanted to call you and say th- say hello and um, I hadn't talked to you in a while and just wanted to say I'm sorry I didn't call you on your birthday. Of course, little things like that go a long way with people. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And uh, uh, so but, speaking of that, you you and I both have October birthdays. We, we just happened here recently. Next year, I believe you have a pretty big birthday coming up. What's what's big on the bucket list? Like what are what are the what what are the the big goals for uh, for you? Like any, any specific species or trips, anything that you're you're doing here this next no, year? No, nothing, 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 nothing real, real big. Nothing, nothing that I know of. Uh, <laughs> but that changes all the time. <laughs> it changes all the time. My my big excitement are my trips with Peter. Those are trips that I really look forward to. Yes. The guy, the guy knows how to put on. He he told me, and you can confirm this. He said, "Yeah, I think I think I believe I put Bill on certainly his biggest snook, and it might be one of the only saltwater species that you've uh, you've ever had mounted there. Is that true?" Yeah, he 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 did that for me. He he made a replica for me, and it was the big. <clears throat> it's been the biggest trail and biggest snook boat. <clears throat> no question. Uh, absolutely the biggest. Man, well, my friend, I will I will let you go. I know you've got some friends in the in the truck now, and you guys hopefully have an amazing trip. Bill, thank you so much. Thank for, you, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate you, buddy. For and, uh, everything. Anytime, anytime you get close or anytime you need anything, I wish you'd let me know. No, oh, ditto. And, and if I, you're hope ever... you, I hope you and your kids have a good uh Good camping trip. Hope the weather holds up for you. Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. Hardest, hardest working man right here, uh, and certainly America's favorite uh, fisherman. And everyone, please, if you haven't already, you know, go subscribe to Bill's channel. Watch him there on all the different channels that he's uh, he's on, and obviously the YouTube and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I don't know if it's you or not, but someone is incredibly active on your uh, your page. So uh, kudos to you for uh, for everything you're doing, my friend. Well, thank you, Joe. You keep up the good work, South Strong. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, t- take a look at that uh, that video that we did for Garmin, and let me know what you think about it. Uh, it it's it's a strong one. Yeah, it's crazy. Like I said, I, I I'm blown okay. away by all the the changes that have happened with these fish finders here in just the past couple of years. And this course, it, it's the most comprehensive thing I've ever seen. And, and even Peter Deeks. He, and that guy knows how to run a boat and use his technology. And he's like, man, I learned, Absolutely. I learned so much in this, uh, in this course, interviewing all these experts. Uh, it's it's going to be a good one. 
Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, Joe. You do a great job, buddy. Right back at you. Thank you so much. Safe travels, and I uh, look forward to seeing some uh, some fish picks. Okay, partner. Have a great week. Thank, Thank you, you, Bill. Buddy. See you, partner. Chat soon. Cause fishing, it's in my soul. It was passed down to me from the days of old. Find us on the wall.